Hello, Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're going to give everyone a few minutes to, to join in, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining. We're gonna go ahead and give everyone a few more minutes um, and then we will kick off. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, we have a very exciting session um, today in partnership with Bounteous, uh, Life After Live Ramp. Um, so we wanted to kick off with just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. So if you have any questions uh, throughout the session, uh, please go ahead and drop those questions um, into the question bar below, and we will address them at the conclusion of the session. Um, I'll, with that, I'll hand it over to Zach Van Doren, who's going to walk us through the agenda and kick off um, content. Thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. Real well, everyone. Let's jump in. All right. So we're, we're very happy to be here. We have, a, I think, a, a very exciting agenda. Um, we, we've uh, simplified the agenda to keep it really um, and tight. Um, we'll be going through... Um, Kind of one uh, signals we're seeing in the market relative to live ramp and some of the challenges um, our customers and kind of market is seeing. So I'm going to share some of those, you know, what, what that feedback. We'll talk about sort of the how to kind of deconstruct and then rebuild the the framework that uh, either live ramp is doing and many other ID kind of space um, single ID space uh, platforms are doing relative to acquisition, marketing, media, in the context of post-cookie deprecation, post-DMP deprecation. So we'll go into that. Uh, we'll go into some use case examples, and then we'll open up for, for Q&A. And uh, so with that, I'll just quickly introduce myself. So I am Zach Van Doren. I'm the Senior Director of Alliances at Action Q, and I focus specialized in identity and ad tech. Uh, I've been here about three years. I have a long background in media, um, started as kind of media planning, strategy buying, and then went into media data, media analytics, then started my own agency um, doing uh, CDP tagging data consulting. And then I've been with Action IQ on the solution side, alliance side for about three years. And uh, Scott, I'd love to, you know, pass it to you and uh, love to hear a little bit on your background and your experience and how it relates to, to this topic. And Scott, you're on mute. So. That always works out that way. <laughs> um, but I thank you all for having me. Um, my background might be a lot like people on the call here. Um, I spent the last five and a half years uh, either selecting, implementing, hiring the teams, um, CDPs. I've done twice on my history. I've worked with Action IQ. Um, I joke that uh, my first stay was um, with a retail um, company and they told me the day I started, they had signed the contract with Action IQ the week before and I had 90 days to um, implement. And luckily we had some good people there with data and Action IQ brought down a really strong team. We hired some people and we were able to actually go live on our first four use cases two weeks early. Um, and then, you know, matured that for the next couple of months or years, um, that Action IQ environment for 
the vendor or for um, the retailer, and then spent the next, gosh, four years um, in multi-brand environments with other with other um, employers, and that to me is where when Zach and I were talking, that's kind of where my past kind of coincides with his of um, dealing with all these complex environments because when you're dealing with multi-brands, you're never walking into a greenfield situation. You're walking into an environment that one VP of marketing who already has their vision of uh, MarTech and they've already started going down that path. Another VP of another brand has a, their vision of MarTech and you've been brought into, or my past have been to bring in by senior leadership to kind of collaborate and get everybody walking in the same path. And, you know, for me, that was a challenge. Um, my time wor working with Action IQ, my first stop, um, taught me a lot about having a vendor that you knew their roadmap, you knew where they were going in the industry, their focus in the industry, and somebody that was willing to be flexible in their future. Because, um, again, when you're working with the environments we work with these days, they're very complex, um, and you just have to be able to make sure that the vendor's understand and can work with you through as you're going through. So, um, you know, my next thing was always, for me, the identity is always the critical part. And again, Zach's the expert in this area. I'm more the color guy from what I've done in my past, but our customers are asking us to do more or want us to do more um, when it comes to personalization these days. They want us to tell them what they should be buying off their things they have bought before. They want all these things, but they want to give us less information or government entities want to give us or have less information. And so that it's almost like we're trying to read in a crystal ball. And I know y'all are dealing with the same issues that we're dealing with, with new things changing all the time. So the one thing that I've learned over my last five plus years is selecting those vendors that are flexible, that are playing nice. What we all learned, learned in kindergarten was play nice with others. Those vendors that play nice with others that aren't so rigid in the way they're looking at the industry that you comply with their way of doing things or you're in trouble. In my past, when I was building a multi-brand domestic environment, it was a little bit easier for some of the vendors that were best to breed to select one. Well, then I moved on to another company that was global and it was multi-brands. Well, now you're actually talking about, okay, this vendor is great in the U.S., but in Asia, they almost have no presence. And in EU, they've just been kicking off for the last year or two. So they're not best to breed over there, but you have to build that global implementation across. So the things that, again, Zach's the smart one here. I'm just telling you, when you start looking at these vendors as you're making these decisions for yourself, make sure you're looking at ones that play nice with others, that are flexible. The cost of the transactions that they're doing are not too high because Marketers will tell you to replace them pretty quickly, and that tears up your roadmap. But those are the focuses that I, I've been on for the last five years or five plus years. I'm now with Bounteous, and I'm lucky to be here because I actually get to work with different companies, not focused on just one company since I was working for it. Now I'm working as an agency, work across great brands every single day on their implementation of CDP. Um, it's challenging. Um, it keeps the brain working, but it's a lot of fun. So, um, Zach, that's me rambling. You awesome. can take it from here. Yeah, Scott, I think, I think the key word of this, this webinar is flexibility, right? And rigidity versus flexibility. And that, that's going to be a lot of what we'll, we'll talk about, uh, this morning as we, we go through it. So great, uh, segue into, into, okay, let's talk about the deconstruction. Okay. And to begin, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, like I said, market feedback. So um, I would say where we get a lot of variations of, I would say these three common uh, themes, again, from, from prospects, from customers, or just from partners generally in the market, right? I think the first most obvious one is it's very expensive or it can be very expensive, right? Uh, we see, um, you know, live ramp, uh, I like to say kind of playing both the currency maker, the merchant and the banker all at the same time, right? There's this notion of the, the ramp ID as a currency. So that's the means of transaction, right? And you have the advertiser, you have the publisher, you have the agency all having to transact, which is to activate a, a, a profile object using that currency, 
right? And there is a, there's a cost occurrence related to both the advertiser or to the agency or to the publisher. There's, so there's a multi-way cost occurrence across the ecosystem to, to activate with that currency or token, if you will, right? There's a, then there's associated technology costs, right? So this is the means of activation, the means of, of transaction of that currency, right? And then you of course have services all on top of that, right? That a lot, that is enabling the process of getting that first party data into that environment, um, translating all that data into a ramp ID uh, space, running the activation, setting up the integration, setting up the enrichment, setting up the resolution, whatever the, the service components might be. So when you take the, the activation components, the technology licensing components, the service components could be multiple millions of dollars that we see, right? Um, at an at a individual brand basis, right? So we're seeing that. Um, we're seeing um, ineff inefficiency, like, like con uh, issues of, of inefficiency. And that's two parts. Like one is just the inefficiency from a workflow standpoint, right? So this is the need to interoperate across multiple different platforms relative to getting first party data, would it be at an audience grain or a profile grain, getting that from one system into LiveRamp. And then you have to really hop from one UI to another UI, sometimes three UIs to perform that sort of that underlying audiencing activation function, right? So lots of just process workflow resource inefficiency. And, and I've seen this many times, right? There's there's inherent lack of ability to scale. Uh, first party paid activation where you're having to hop, say, from a CDP to, a, to an onboarding UI or from a CRM system or from a data warehouse system to an onboarding UI, right? And there's time to market, which is the other kind of inefficiency component. So with all of that kind of multiple hops, then you have um, impact relative to just underlying time to market, getting that audience from, from concept, from point of activation, point of audiencing, point of triggering that, that kind of that send into the downstream publisher. And that could be multiple days between hitting the, the trigger on, on activating that audience to, to realizing and serving ads and or experience that audience, right? The third is, uh, is this larger issue of, of control kind of slash transparency, right? So once you transform all of your first party data to one ID space, whether it be the ramp ID or whatever, yeah, it, 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 what other, other ID space it, it could be, once you transform that to that ramp ID and then you have that data all kind of housed within that, that environment, you are completely locked down to that, to that vendor, right? So you have, you're losing a lot of agility and related to your ability to understand your audience, to um, manage the and the or and orchestrate the experience, the journeys, the activation related to that audience, the ability to activate that audience, the ability to measure that audience, the ability to model that audience, the ability to control permissioning and governments go governance on the audience. Like you lose a ton of control when you transform everything and you know house your customer 360 infrastructure within that environment where it's all transcoded into that one ID, right? And so, um, you know, in this first party kind of age of um, where you really need that underlying control of that as a critical asset, we, we think it's very dangerous for enterprise brands to, to um, have a oh, fully over indexing on one ID space related to how and where they control that, that data, et cetera. Okay. So that's what we see just um, high level. So let's talk about sort of the, the deconstruction of it as I, as I define it, right? So the way we look at this is, you know, at a very high level, of course, there's, there's data and there's technology. And I mentioned this, you know, in the prior slide, you have data is the means of profiling. It's the means of enriching the profile. It's the means of ensuring permissioning of that profile. It's the means of addressing that profile, right? So that's an underlying data problem, right? Then you have the technology, right? So this is the means, again, as I mentioned, the means of transaction on that currency, if you will, right? So this is designing audiences, building art journeys, um, creating experiences, activating those experiences, measuring those experiences. So this is all a, a function of, of technology. Uh, and by activation, I mean that that could also include both ingress of data, right? And it could be the egress of data, right? So um, um, integration, normalization of data across multiple different systems and activation outbound into multiple different owned media 
destinations, right? So you have to decouple the data from the technology, right? And, um, and if you look at uh, the proliferation of, of data services, and then you look at the proliferation of technology services, it becomes very complex and very, very complicated, right? And so uh, one thing that these ID spaces do um, is they kind of create an easy button, if you will, right? We will handle both the, the, the technology component, we'll handle the data component, right? We'll get it, all your data into the, our system and we'll provide you kind of a simple UI for your your marketers, your, your business users to access that data and to, to run activation, right? Et cetera, right? So it's and on the surface level, it's it's it feels like a good story because it's simplified and it's kind of an easy kind of easy route to take and kind of as DMPs collapse and as third party cookies go away, but uh, there's there's a lot of inherent problems to this. Okay. So um, with that, you know, we'll talk about uh, this this concept of design, right? And so I think, uh, um, you know, uh, Steve, you said it very well, right? This the notion of flexible versus rigid design, right? And so um, on the left, we have this idea of what, like sort of the current or historical paradigm related to how many CDPs have interacted with um, paid media activation as opposed to in contract with owned media activation, right? So traditionally CDP is set on top of PII owned or kind of controlled data. So as such, they operationalized and an enabled experience in the mostly in the post acquisition, post lead conversion uh, media spaces, right? So this is email, websites, call centers in store, clienteling. This is retargeting. This is this is callback. Uh, this is winbacks. This is churn prevention. This is onboarding, right? So this is all that 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 kind of that retention marketing world, right? And then traditionally, many CDPs would when it onboard into kind of we call it a single ID space. So again, this could be Live Ramp, could also be um, Epsilon People Cloud. It could be um, Low to Me with the with their panoramic. Just this notion of transforming all that first party data into one ID space, and you have it housed within one platform and you're, you're you're running activation across the programmatic ecosystem through that one ui that one id space right and that's what we mean by a, a closed design right and as you know we, we talked about this is rigid this is not flexible and there's a lot of inherent risk uh to this like and so um one of those risks of course is the um sort of the the assurity that there's going to be instability in the market in the forthcoming couple of years right and so brands need a, an, an ability to interoperate and be flexible across different ID spaces, whether it be it relates to third-party cookie deprecation and where the market sits and where it is. It could be relative to regional um, or market um, specific um, enablement. Like some ID spaces are more stronger in India versus US versus uh, APAC, right? Some ID spaces are much stronger in the B2B space versus the B2B, B2C space. Some are much stronger relative to if you're a publisher or a CPG or a retailer, right? Um, it's just, there's so many myriad of, of factors related to where your enterprise is and, you know, in, in context to these parameters that it's, it's, it's just imperative that you have that flexibility, right? So if you go from that single ID space, kind of close design, you go to what we have been espousing in the market, we call an open, flexible or federated design, right? And so you start with a singular orchestrated technology, right? So you start with a technology that is purpose built for audiencing journeys, activation, orchestration, right? Um, you you de decouple the identity data component, which is the means of addressability, the means of enrichment with the technology component, right? Because you just can't do both well, right? You can do one or the other, um, if you try to do one or the other and both, you're not going to do them well, right? And so decouple those components, right? And so you um, start with a, a CDP and then you interoperate across various identity spaces that have been replacing the third party cookie, right? So this could be wall garden IDs. These could be new forms of identity tokens like the UID and the ID5 and the panoramic, the fabric ID from Newstar. This could be programmatic IDs as in where they kind of can, can exist and co or coexist right now. And this of course can also include identity spine partners, right? So this could be Newstar, this could be Merkle, this could be Axiom, 
This could be, you know, uh, emerging players in the market like Full Contact or Astra, whatnot, right? So the idea, again, is to interoperate and create and run profiling resolution in, in a way that allows brands to choose who they connect with, how they activate, um, in terms of in terms of currencies and tokens and, and, and activation components, right? Um, and this this also gives like, one crucial benefit here is is this notion of full journey activation, right? So if you want to run you know owned and, and paid orchestration within a singular journey, if you want to design a kind of end to end kind of initial brand touch point to secondary touch, touch point to lead conversion beyond. And if you want to have full kind of journey design related to that funnel, you, you know, that that's also a component of this, right? Is to really bring together owned and paid into that one, into that orchestration framework. Right. Um, I think I'll pause if, uh, if um, I'm sure, Scott, if you want to have anything to say to this or, or whatnot, but I, otherwise I can keep going. You know, for us, no, I, I, just, I would just say the hops for us were, was critical in the past um, that we are, um, marketing teams were always looking at is, you know, the speed, how's how long is it going to take us to do these things? And it's amazing how, um, an hour is a long time for some of these people. Um, and you just don't want to have all these places in there that you haven't to go out to. You want to be that center. So I agree with all that. Yeah. 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 And, um, again, I, I would just stress the, the a question of efficiency, a question of control and transparency. Right. And then there's there's a cost component here, too, as well. Right. Um, so many of these I identity spaces, um, they're not, you know, trans you know, they're not charging a full end to end transaction fee across both the advertiser, and the publisher. Many of these tokens are, are free. I'm mean, just incurring costs if you're if you are you know, purchasing media against that. Right. Um, and I would also just stress and we'll, we'll get into this a bit more. The. Um, the programmatic uh, publishers and the wall gardens, they are just increasingly opening up their, their APIs and enabling and allowing you know, onboarding activation uh, capacity, right? So this includes the emergence of the, uh, the CAPIs, you know, the conversion APIs from, from Meta and Google. This includes uh, very tight integrations between, say, the UID and the trade desk and, and, and whatnot. This can include the uh, Yahoo's Connect ID and that that connectivity into the uh, DSP space. Um, Amazon and what they're doing with their identity graphing and whatnot, right? So there's a lot of optionality. There's a lot of choice, and there's a lot of a, there's a lot of opportunity to take advantage of this increasingly opened up ecosystem that has been really disrupting kind of the traditional hegemony that LiveRap had in that and that control, right, and that reach, right. And so from a technology standpoint, right, from our standpoint, you know, it's our responsibility to uh, enable brands to to engage with us in that opportunity, which is to the integrations, the API synchronizations, the, uh, the identity integrations, whatnot. And, and so that's our role from a technology and orchestrating, again, these data components. Right. And, and again, I, I just stress the, the disaggregation between the, the tech and, and the data. And that really is the key to enable this, this flexible agile design in this uh, post third party cookie world, right? Okay. And we'll keep going. So we'll dive into some use case examples, right? And so um, these are the, kind of the, the, the core use cases that I think many, many of you are familiar with, right? So there's the Remarketing use case, there's prospecting look liking and there's this the the baseline first party activation, right? So um, remarket, right? So you have you know major challenges and, and major um, pressure on on remarketing as a use case in third party cookie deprecation, right? Um, and uh, um, this I would say absolutely stresses just underscores the need for flexibility relative to how and where you operate, interoperate across identity spaces that are enabling this functionality in, in the context of third-party cookies going away, right? So uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the ramp ID is uh, really uh, losing, I would say, uh, kind of uh, f you know, frequency and uh, reach related to this use case in the context of kind of 
permission-based, email-based um, profiling versus anonymous-based visitor and, and visitor profile, right? Um, Ramp ID is very much moving into a kind of a email-based, permission-based graph. Um, you have other players, most namely, you have the conversion APIs of Google and Meta filling the gap in this space, enabling a first party based uh, remarketing uh, kind of enablement that traditionally often has been, you know, orchestrated within the, the channel, right? So what you, what many brands are doing with, as DMPs are going away and as sort of the traditional platforms are losing this functionality is they're going into Facebook, they're going into Google, they're going into TikTok, they're going into trade desk, like, and they're doing running remarketing in a very siloed, um, you know, disconnected single threaded fashion. Right. And so what we espouse is this, this designed architecture where you, again, you interoperate across the, these first party identities in, in a way where you can centrally orchestrate the ability to then run activate, run remarketing activation and one centralized audiencing, uh, a platform across the Facebooks and Googles and, and TikToks and trade desks, Right. And so that this is really requires synchronization and integration on the tag SDK side to orchestrate all that synchronization um, of IDs and ID spaces, right? Uh, prospecting look liking, right? So uh, you have, this has also been kind of a traditional kind of home of the DMP and um, LiveRamp is, you know, does this as well, right? So this is, you know, taking, say traditionally taking a third party prospect universe then taking a first party, let's say high value seed, modeling that high value first party seed against that third party universe, right? It's all, but all of this is, is informed by translation of all that identity into third party cookies. And that was the mean to join that data together, right? So um, whether it be a third party cookie kind of a join, whether it be a ramp ID join, right, et cetera. Um, again, what we're finding is uh, um, uh, us as a, as a technology leaning towards uh, uh, data providers and data partners that have just have more inherent inoperability and related to how, uh, you know, either ourselves as Action IQ or other platforms being able to interoperate and contain and, and make use of those prospect universes, right? And so um, we have this, you know, uh, here at Action IQ, we have an ability to run a lookalike where we can take that prospect universe, we can contain it, we can host it, or we can, we can extrapolate and virtually access it within, say, a cloud environment. We can run a look lookalike model extraction and we can output um, lookalike audiences that are keyed against that provider and run activation run through paid media, either using their keys or other um, addressable keys that we might be part of that uh, extraction. Right. So, again, it, it goes from the need for a central orchestration of this function as opposed to doing it within a constrained single ID space or, again, doing it within kind of just a hokey channel by channel <clears throat> basis, right? Um, the other one is, is first party activation, right? So this is the traditional sort of onboarding of one CRM data into a single ID space, transform to that ID space, and then you're sort of within that UI to have to orchestrate actual activation downstream, right? So this is usually three hops, right? Maybe four, right? From the CRM or the CDP or the warehouse to the, the onboarding UI and the onboarding UI into the publisher and the publisher, that's, that's when you orchestrate that, that data, right? As I mentioned, this is all breaking up, right? From a technology data and you know, piping API plumbing standpoint, right? So as Google, Meta, Trade Desk, Yahoo, Amazon, um, major players actively in, enhancing and, and increasing ability to activate into their APIs, we as, an, as a technology absolutely taking advantage of that to, so that's a question of a piping and activation plan of plumbing. Then you have the an operability across different ID spaces. Again, kind of going back to the central theme of data versus tech. So containing and managing profiles that are max, kind of maximum optimized addressability by connecting and threading across different ID signals and spaces that enable that transition the transaction being from the advertiser to the publisher using these keys as a means of transaction, right? So this is decentralized, this is open, this is flexible, right? And uh, uh, we were having uh, a lot of success over the last few years and, and, you know, enabling brands to make that transition at this baseline to run that and do that. Okay. All righty. 
How did I do there, Scott? Any any other comments there? No, they're hitting it right on there. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. All righty. All righty, uh, folks. I think we can now open it up with questions. You know, I I did a kind of a sprint of a monologue there. So uh, uh, open any any suggestions or any comments or questions, and we'll we'll take it from there. Awesome. Yeah, we had some great questions uh, come in through the chat. Thank you to our audience um, for your engagement. So the first question we have, um, what would need to be prepared for? What would we need to be prepared for if we transition away from live ramp? Are there any special considerations we should be making? Yeah. Um, well, again, I would go back to data and tech, right? So um, preparation, you have to look at preparation in the context of, okay, how do I um, enable addressability of my first party data? So that's a data question, problem challenge. And then um, how and where do I activate that data, right? Um, so I would start from that as a, as kind of a baseline foundation, right? Um, you know, in, the enablement of addressability and, and how and where do we activate, right? As, so it's a data and a tech challenge question. Right. Um, um, so start with that premise. Um, I would also, you know, we're finding many clients to be, you know, first few clients are very over indexed with live ramp and they have a lot of workflow and a lot of media flowing through as you, you don't need to go through a tumultuous or disruptive transition process, right? You can go through a gradual transition process, right? You can start with one channel, a few audiences, you can run match rate tests, right? So it doesn't need to be a scary high risk um, um, proposition for a brand to, to ease that transition and, and kind of migrate in a way that they can they can test and iterate relative to match and performance efficacy related to workflow um, processes related to training management if, if and where that's needed, right? So, you know, I would, I would stress that as well, right? And I would add, Zach, I would add on to that as you, and you mentioned this was, I would, the phased approach um, when you're going through this, set realistic expectations as you're going through this and test it as you're going through. Yes. Um, that is critical because, again, when people think they're just going to do a big lift and shift, which I always hear people are going to do, and it's, it always comes back and, oh, we had to come back. And we didn't, it didn't work the way we thought it was going to work. So be patient, build the phases, and work the plan um, on that and test, test, test. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing I would add, McKinsey, is uh, yeah. this this adds a new kind of planning paradigm, a new mode of thinking, right? Because you you know traditionally have your your media mix, you have your martech stack, your ad tech stack, you have your data stack, but you now have this idea of a of an identity stack or identity portfolio, right? So um, you have to with all this more with this control and this transparency comes, I would say, more responsibility to the brand related to that that planning uh, paradigm, right? Which identity spaces do I connect with? Which ID partners do I partner with? How do I activate this, right? So, you know, to discuss point like this, this really requires iterative phased approach to kind of optimize and tweak and inform, you know, this this activation process to, to maximize reach, right? And to and they really achieve parity in terms of media efficacy, but also to really improve that and advance that, right? Awesome. I think this actually leads really well into our into our next question. Um, what other technologies in the ecosystem should we be aware of for replacing live ramp? Um, how does this approach address both data accuracy and quality? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll, I'll take it first. Uh, so other other technology, right? So you know, one big movement. As, you know, I think many of you know is the um, increasing importance of, of cloud infrastructure. Many brands are moving their C360 infrastructure into Redshift and Snowflake or Databricks or GCP, right? So, so that is a kind of an emerging sort of paradigm, if you will. And so taking into account how and where a, let's say a new campaign activation orchestra orchestration layer, where, whether it's us or any other tech, how that interrelates and operates within a cloud infrastructure it is a, from a technology standpoint, is a very important consideration. Also, a very important consideration is the the collection, right? The the data collection at the point of um, 
experience, right? And so that gets into tagging, SDKs, you know, structure. This gets into web-based, uh, tag-based identity syncing, um, enablement, and, and use case, right? So you, in order to really do this from a, and, and enable this, this entirety of this use case, including remarketing, right, as example, you need to look at this not just in the context of uh, storing, computing, and profiling and activating, but it has to start with also the, the data collections point, and that requires tech to do that, right? Mainly in the, the TAG SDK um, space, and that needs to be very tightly coordinated into operating across whether us as a CDP or and or with the, the cloud infrastructure that might be housing the uh, C360 right? infrastructure. I could keep going, but uh, <laughs> stop it. I think you hit that one pretty well. Okay. Amazing. Um. So we just we just had another another question come in through the chat. Um. Can you please repeat some of the ID resolution partners? Um. You know, Merkel, Full Contact, et cetera, that you mentioned. Um. In the webinar, are there some top partners that you recommend? Uh. Yeah. So. Um, Let's say Merkle is a, is a big partner of ours, uh, Merkle Mercury, right, with their assets. So Newstar is a big partner, Axiom is a partner, um, Adstra, uh, Full Contract, Full, I'm sorry, full Contact, um, Dun & Bradstreet on the, on the BDB side. Um, those are our primary partners right now. And again, we, we look for partners that are embrace this, this idea of the federated open design, right? where you can interoperate and you can contain and you could uh, manage identities that let's say are keyed and or um, substantiated by that, uh, that ID space. You can, you can do that within multiple and, and kind of open platforms, right? So we look for data partners that, that kind of adhere to that philosophy and we, we embrace partnerships with those, with those players, right? And so we have, we have a lot of uh, joint solutioning and a lot of tight, Kind of coordination and partnering with those providers for you know major enterprise brands that require again like very tight orchestration integration between us as tech and and those those uh, vendors as sort of the underlying data foundation ID foundation partners. But, so um, you know and we like the way we think about it is uh, usually you have one or two kind of ID spine partners as a foundational kind of layer going across the digital and kind of off offline terrestrial spheres. And then you have our, kind of the, the, the need to interoperate across other currencies and tokens to again, maximize addressability um, upon, like foundationally upon that, that one ID graph, right? So that gets into again to the Metacapi, right? The Google offline conversion API, the UID, right? Multiple kind of players that should be interoperating along with that kind of core ID fine, ID spine partner. But, but one thing I'd say is, is add on to that is yes, that these are partners that, um, action IQ has, but it does not relieve you of your homework on your side of what's specific about your company and your instance that is unique and is different than maybe somebody else. And so to me, that's where you're going to need to spend a lot of your time and looking at, okay, what's unique about your circumstance at your company and which vendor fits into that the best. Um, yeah. Because um, again, those are great partners, but they might work for me at one company and I've seen it in the past. They didn't work for me for the next company I worked for and because of different things. So you just have to be, it's, it's, that's the part of your own homework you have to get done. That's right. Yeah. And Scott, that, that goes back to the point of identity as a, as a strategy paradigm, right? The, the, the idea of, um, of an identity stack, right? That would correlate to your to your Martech stack, at Matex, whatever you want to call it now. So, yeah, I was about to say a change. Matech, Martech, Adtech, whatever, whatever you want to call. It. Awesome. Okay. Well, that is it in terms of our questions um, for today. I just want to thank our speakers, uh, Zach and Scott. Thank you so much for for joining us here today. Uh, this was a, a great session, um, and thank you so much to our audience uh, for joining us as well. Um, any any final thoughts, Zach or Scott, that you that you wanted to share? Uh, it's exciting times, right? Um, you know, for me, being an old ad tech agency guy going into quote Martech, right, and seeing all this convergence of ad tech and Martech into Mad tech, 
for me, it's it's really coming full circle and it's very exciting and, and a lot of fun. So, uh, um, you know, love the space and, and uh, love talking about this stuff. So, yeah, Zach and I would agree with that one. To me, and my part and I am in my career, it keeps the brain moving. And you seem like you're, I mean, the stuff that came out this last week with Google on Monday on some of their stuff, you know, it's like, OK, now we're changing again on something that I need to go do more reading on. You're never ahead. It seems like you're always kind of falling behind yeah. on all the stuff you need to be reading and testing out. So, um, yeah, it's it's a great it's a great industry to be in. Um, and I think about Action IQ five years ago, five and a half years ago, when I first started working with Action IQ and how different they are now compared to the tool is. Um, it's it's a lot of fun to see where it's going. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, thank you both so much. Um, and thank you again to our audience. Um, we'll be in touch with the full recording um, of today's session, as well as some helpful resources um, around this topic. Um, but thank you all again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, McKinsey.